morning, folks. Welcome back to Birding But Cool. I'm out here just uh, outside of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. It's a wonderful winter morning. There's a lot of bird activity here. It's just cold enough that the birds are, are out and moving around. Not too cold for me. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of noise going on. And on days like this in Alberta, if you're from around here, you probably know that the most common thing to be hearing is none other than the call of the black-capped chickadee. And uh, I'm watching a few fly around right now. You might notice some of them in the back of the shot. There's one right there. Um, and these birds are quite cute. They're very abundant, and uh, they like to hang around and stick out the winters in Edmonton. So I'm going to try and get some footage of them. They like to come in quite close. One just flew <laughs> just out of shot right over my head. Uh, you just missed it. Um, but we'll see how that goes. If you live in North America, at least in the, the central or eastern part of the continent, you're probably familiar with the black-capped chickadee. There are these adorable little birds that are very abundant in uh, forested areas of all kinds. They're cute and they make all these little calls. They often travel in these little groups. And as you can see with this one here, they, uh, <laughs> they're pretty tame, and they oftentimes will uh, be pretty accustomed to people in the right places. They're, uh, they're always fun to watch. And this one, I noticed, uh, looked a little bit different. You can see it's got a bit of a band on its leg there. This is obviously something that was uh, put on by human beings studying chickadees. And uh, it turns out I actually uh, got into contact with the person who put this band on, as well as a bunch of other ones, and they're doing some very cool work about chickadees. Today's episode of One at a Time has a special guest edition, and uh, that is none other than Jan Vimega, who uh, works for the University of Alberta, studying black-capped chickadees. I talked to Jan a bit about what his work is and uh, what we know about these wonderful little birds. All right, Jan, we're out, we're out here, um, and, you know, we've got a lot of chickadees around, so I figured I'd, I'd give, give the opportunity to, to ask you a few questions. Yes. And, um, you know, the first thing I wanted to ask you, because I noticed you're only really looking at chickadees out here, and, and so why, why are they a good bird to be studying, and why They're are the they best. interesting? <laughs> no, uh, I, look, I like looking at a lot of birds, but I, I think we think chickadees are extra special. Uh, as you mentioned before, they're one of the few birds that stay around in this climate, right. the cold winters. And we're especially interested in, in how they're doing that. How can they survive such a cold climate, uh, days of minus 30 Celsius in a row, um, where most birds, most of the pastoring small birds, they fly south to winter in either southern United States or even in the tropics. They stick around here. How do they do it? And um, yeah, they have some special adaptations. Uh, other small birds around here have that too, like knot hatches. Uh, we get red poles here in the winter. Um, but chickadees are of a special interest because they're very numerous year round. And that makes them an excellent species to study because that means you have good sample size. They're easy to catch. They come to feeders and yeah, makes them perfect for us. So. Um, obviously, you know, you and, and your research group, y'all have been working at this for a really long time, and, and uh, it seems like one of the key questions is how do chickadees survive the Edmonton winters being so small? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, what have you found so far, or what does is, what is, uh, the uh, literature tell us? Yeah, so other people have done quite a bit of work on it already. Uh, one of the things is they, they grow extra feathers, so in the fall they, they molt like most pastorines do, so they get a fresh set of feathers that they've been wearing all year. Uh, but then for chickadees and some other species specifically, they, they grow some extra down and, and small body contour feathers that helps them keep warm. Uh, even some extra feathers covering their, the base of their bill. Um, so that's one adaptation, putting on a thicker coat. Uh, another one is uh, they do a lot of food caching. So they, especially in the fall, they start uh, foraging like crazy. And not just food to eat immediately, but a lot of food they put away for later use. And uh, to help with that, they need good spatial memory. There's tons of chickadees. Yeah, they're right behind well. the camera. They're, they're listening in to see if we get it right. <laughs> um, so they need good spatial memory to retrieve all the f 
all the seeds they hide, because it, this can be hundreds or even thousands of seeds that they cache away for later. And finally, another one is um, birds are on pretty warm compared to humans, so 42 degrees Celsius. Um, that costs a lot of energy, and especially in the winter, of course, when it's so cold, to keep that engine running burns a lot of fuel. And what chickadees can actually do is when it gets really cold, they'll drop their body temperature at night, basically lowering the, the temperature a bit to burn at lower levels and, and save some energy. Um, that's not without cost, of course. It does mean that when they wake up, they can't just fly off. They for, first need to sort of warm up, and they, they do that by actively shaking to get their muscles to all start uh, trembling to, to warm up again, get ready for the day. So, uh, whoops. Okay. So yeah, there's, a, there's a bunch of really cool uh, adaptations they have to survive this cold. And then uh, yeah, what we like to study, uh, on top of that, why individuals differ in the way they deal with, with energy constraints and the cold. Uh, so we, you can imagine that if you study a chickadee or any bird or any animal, you can see what is the optimal behavior given a certain temperature. Right, you say, oh, they need to eat this much when it's this cold and this much when it's that cold. But what we find is, uh, like with many behaviors in animals, just like humans, is that individuals vary quite a bit. And it's not just random variation. It's some individuals always seem to eat more than others. And we're trying to figure out why some chickadees eat more than others do, uh, whether that's do they just have a bigger engine? Just like if you have a bigger car, you probably need more gas because it's less efficient. Uh, do they simply behave differently? Do they, are they more active than other individuals? Uh, so there's a whole suite of behaviors that we sort of try to understand in light of energy requirements and behavior and, and how that those two shape um, the way they behave. And yeah, and, and it's um, that kind of led into my next question because you mentioned the importance of looking at these individual characteristics. And I noticed when we were looking at the chickadees that they all, all the ones that are banded or ringed have different colors and, and sort of uh, multiple colors. And so I was wondering a bit about how you uh, identify individuals by these bands and how you, you know, capture and, and ring them and keep track of all the different individuals. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so uh, the bands we put on uh, when we catch them, so besides the standard metal band, by the banding station that has a long number on it, uh, that band allows you to identify individuals because each number is unique. Um, the problem is those bands you can't read with your binoculars yeah, in see. the field, right? So, yeah. And since we're interested in individual behavior, we need to be able to identify individuals. And by using different colors in different orders, um, you can identify a bird just by looking at the colors. Um, which for chickadees isn't the easiest because they don't like to sit still very much. They move around constantly. Uh, but with a bit of patience and experience, you, you should be able to see which color is on the left and on the right and which one is on top and on the bottom. And uh, that way we can ID them in the field without the need of capturing them again. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, it is very, very difficult. When we were looking, I was you were calling out that you were like, oh, red, yellow, whatever. And I'm like, I, I didn't see it. It, took, yeah. it flew away already. But And, of, of course, as, as people may be hearing, uh, chickadees like to make a lot of noise, and they have a few different vocalizations. You know, they, they get their name from the chickadee dd -D, okay. um, and they also have little chirps and twitters, and then they have their sort of song, which is the, the high-pitched beep-beep. Uh, not my best interpretation. Yeah. Sorry, oh, folks. But um, what is, you know, obviously these things all have a different purpose. And so what is the, the sort of significance and meaning of, of each of these different calls? There's a lot of different calls described. I, I couldn't tell you the whole list off the top of my <laughs> head. But, uh, yeah, so the chickadee is a common one uh, that's used sort of a wide range. There's a lot about, it's not just about the words, but also the way you say the words, right? And so for the chickadee, you might notice that sometimes they do chickadee D, just with two Ds, and sometimes they do more Ds. And it's been found that if there's danger around, like a bird of prey, they will do more Ds because mm. they're more aggravated. Um, and they sort of start telling each other, hey, there's something wrong here, be careful. Um, they have these contact calls, just to sort of chip, 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 chip. So they're constantly telling each other where they are and sort of keep in touch and... Um, because one of the reasons they live in groups in the winter, it, it helps keep them safe. Uh, 
more eyes is better, right? So if there's a predator around and if you're a group of 10, you're more likely to spot it than when you're by yourself. Uh, yeah, and then we have these sort of gargle calls, they call them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's usually when they're sort of aggravated by conspecifics or by other chickadees that are around, maybe from a different flock that don't belong there. Um, they might be upset with a, a flock mate that, that's coming too close to a partner, so often in a flock there will be the dominant pair that's also in spring is likely to be the breeding pair so they sort of lead the flock and um, but yeah they're, so they're constantly in touch with each other letting others know what's going on and and then finally you have this very high pitched call which is quite similar between species and that's usually when there's imminent danger so there might be a, a sparrow hawk or a um, sharp shinned hawk in North America coming in and uh, and trying to, to eat one and that, that's really when they the high pitch makes that it's very hard to localize where it's from, so it doesn't oh. help the predator to see where they are, but it does warn the other flock mates to, to hide, and usually they'll go into a dense tree to uh, get into the branches and away from the predator. Oh, okay. I didn't know that about the high pitch. That's yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, my last question then is, obviously, um, there's a lot that is known about chickadees because they're so, they're, they're so common, but what would you say is... Um, is sort of like the main thing that needs to be found out or like the main question uh, right now. And, and maybe it's not a, just about chickadees, but something mm. that you can learn about birds in general just from chickadees. But what would you say is sort of like the most pressing or important thing that, that you, and your, you, know, your, you and your colleagues mm. are trying to figure out? Yeah, I, I think what we really, I mean, there's, for us what's really important, what we really want to know is, is how individuals differ in the way they deal with the cold. And... <coughs> whether one way is better than another way. Right? So like I said, they, they could drop their body, t body temperature at night to uh, make sure they save energy to be still alive in the morning. And it sounds very dramatic, but a chickadee could literally starve to death overnight. Yeah, so if it yeah. doesn't feed enough or if it does spend too much energy overnight, it could be, it could be dead in the morning. And then you think, okay, well, if it's so critical, there must be an optimum way of doing it. Yet we find that some birds eat more than others, even though it's, you know, they experience the same weather conditions during the day. The night is the same length for both of them. Why do they do things differently? And, um, and, and that's sort of a, a general theme in our research is to look at how, why do individuals differ in the way they behave? You know, we like to think they're sort of the best way of doing things, but it's not, and understanding why this different best depending on who you are is, is what we're really trying to understand well well there we go so we've got chickadee expert jan viminga and uh i just want to say thanks again for for You're taking welcome. the opportunity yeah. to chat very cool stuff um that's great thanks big thanks to everybody who watched this week's edition of one at a time especially if you've made it this far shout out to jan as well for chatting with me and uh, we did a little bit of birding it was a really fun time he's always a, a great guy to hang out with and uh, if you want to follow him at twitter his his twitter is on the screen as well uh, additionally if you enjoyed today's video don't forget to leave a like uh, subscribe if you want to see more like this still still putting out a video every week still making good on that promise uh, and hopefully as the weather begins to warm up hopefully soon it'll be even easier for me to get Lots of good bird footage as there are more birds around. Anyway, folks, that's all I have to say. Thanks so much, and I will see you on the next one.